Environment TV, uh, the substitute for the left forum panel. Uh, this is supposed to be at the left forum on Sunday, June 1st, but instead we're holding it outdoors because they want to make us pay to go in. Uh, I'm Ken Gale. I host Ecologic on WBAI, and I've been an ambassador's activist for a long, long, long time. And I'm here with four wonderful panelists who are... Tim Keating, Director of Rainforest Relief. J.K. Canepa from New York Climate Action Group and uh, Occupy Wall Street Environmental Solidarity and Coalition Against the Rockaway Pipeline. I'm Kim Frachek, the coordinator of Sane Energy Project, and I also work with Occupy the Pipeline and build giant artwork with the people's puppets of Occupy Wall Street. Hello, I'm Donna Stein. I'm with New York City Friends of Clearwater. I'm the president of that organization. We just started a organization, uh, Pete and Toshi Seeger Environmental Educators Network, uh, which we're working to develop. I'm also with Occupy the Pipeline, uh, Occupy Wall Street Environmental Solidarity Organization, and Reclaim.cc, a uh, organization that's going to uh, expose the corporate takeover uh, of, of organizations, and starting with the UN. So there are small environmental groups, there's large environmental groups, uh, there's people who work only locally, people who work uh, internationally. What's the difference? Kim, let's start with you. Um, I find that uh, working on a grassroots level, um, I tend to have much more um, power, I guess, over our actions and we can sort of, everybody, where everybody has more of a input on how things are going to go and how things are going to be said. Um, we tend to, when we do work with, we do a lot of times um, work with larger organizations to, you know, for uh, um, um, events and things like that. And I, I tend to find that the narrative um, becomes very focused on, on like, um, one piece of the pie without having any option to expand this, the narrative of um, what you're trying to convey to the public. So, for instance, um, I, I, I just find that like if, if we wanted to talk about um, fracking infrastructure in the state of New York and we wanted to talk about the LNG ports and the waste disposal and the storage and the pipelines and the compressor stations. Um, we would like to do that, we tend to do that in a very creative way. We feel like we have um, a really good art, arts group and we use our art to, to sort of like um, be creative with our actions and try things that might not make sense um, but that turn out to be really wonderful and we find that when we work with larger groups we don't tend to have that freedom because they'll want to keep the message on just banning fracking without explaining what fracking could potentially open up to like some people think fracking is just the drilling um, and we'd like to open up the narrative a little bit bigger it sometimes becomes its own you know, it like a like a chant that you just hear over and over and over again, where it loses its meaning. So sometimes being able to be creative and sort of step outside of like a traditional protest um, is really important. And I feel like I have much more um, power to be able to step outside of a traditional protest working on a grassroots level. I'm working with. Uh, large organizations, your hands are tied. You have to do everything by committee. You have to. You have to. Um, uh, there is the danger that large organizations are uh, beholden to their uh, their their sponsors. Large organizations, by their nature, have to grow, have to have more resources, have to bring in more money. Uh, grant money is not as behold as easy to get as corporate money, so they are uh, they're compromised. When you get organizations like New York City Friends of Clearwater's parent company, uh, Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, they take corporate money, but not 
large corporations, local corporations. This is the first time in uh, decades of, of activism that I've worked for with New York City Friends of Clearwater is a 501c3. We're still grassroots. We're all volunteer, we have no, no budget, um, we don't pay anybody, we don't have an office, although that would be nice. Uh, but uh, the grass, with the grassroots organizations, you are free to be creative, you're free to do whatever you want. I, um, I, I'm very active in Occupy Wall Street uh, groups, and I probably would be curtailed from that if I worked for one of the national organizations. Well, just let's take where we are right this minute and why we're out here in this park. Now, we're not talking about a grassroots organization, the Left Forum. We're talking about a lot of grassroots organizations who are trying to give their panels uh, a, a voice and trying to, to get the word out to the audience about 46 different issues are going on at the same time. And the amount of money that's being charged is so... Uh, prohibitive that it, it doesn't reflect the, the left. This is similar to what's happening in the grassroots. I just, I, I know that uh, everybody's going to say really appropriate things, so I cheated. I brought something here I wanted to share. This happened a year ago. It was called the uh, Spring Gala. It was in honor of our departed, not missed Mayor Bloomberg, the Green Mayor, and he was um, s celebrated by the League of Conservation Voters, the New York LCV, for his environmental advocacy. And the biggest benefactor, the, one of the three biggest benefactor was Scott's miracle Grow. Scott's miracle Grow is the American arm of Monsanto. Patrons include Chesapeake Energy Corporation, Chesapeake, who, by the way, donated $21 million to Sierra Club National. It included Con Edison, the friends of ours who, who, uh, is, who are bringing Spectra gas, frack gas from Pennsylvania. It included NRG Energy, who uh, invest for people in gas and oil. And let's see. Uh, oh, Entergy. The nuclear. Right. So let's get to the let's get to the big greens who are also at that dinner, and I'll skip over a few like NRDC and Williams, our our Williams was famous for Transco Pipeline and the Rockaway Lateral. Who are they sitting with? They're sitting with um, NRDC. Um, they're sitting with League of Conservation Voters, and they're sitting at the table with uh, Environmental Defense Fund. So that's what happens when nationals get entangled in, uh, uh, I just want to say something about corporate versus um, foundation funding. Foundation funding is corporate funding. Let's be, f let's be clear about that. Foundation's money don't, doesn't come out of thin air. It comes from the corporations who have invested in the biggest money-making industries, lumber, gas, oil, coal. That's what foundation money really is. Or it's the rich children of Rockefellers and the Fords and the Mercks. Merck was at this dinner too. So uh, one of the things about the grassroots from personal experience is that we get out in the community or we come from the community and we talk to the people in the community. They don't have to go to Washington to talk to NRDC about the danger of fracking in their children's schoolyard. They talk to the people who are activists who live with them and work with them and send their kids to school with them. That's what grassroots is. And you tell your city council person or your local state senator, you know, I've got 3,000 people in my community you better do what we ask you to do. That's what grassroots is. Well, that's certainly a good start. Um, I think a, a lot of what I have to say reflects very much what, what's already been said, but one of the things that, that uh, I think is really a key element to the issue of grassroots versus nationals is, is uh, of course, people are talking about money, but the reality is when you get to a certain size where you have a number of staff people, 
you have to run your nonprofit like a business. And this, this is what I think really becomes the crux of the problem because in a capitalist society running, running a business, there are a number of things that you, know, you have fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders as a corporation. Well, you know, national organizations have a fiduciary responsibility to, to the people who gave them money. And, and that, whether that's foundations or, or corporations, you know, somebody said foundations uh, aren't corporations, but, you know, and, and, and certainly there can be a difference between corporate money and foundation money, but the reality is the foundations also function as businesses. And I, I mean, I've been to meetings where, where foundations are, are talking about being the first into this issue or being the foundation that was known for that issue. And so there's like competition among foundations to perform, just like there is competition among national organizations to perform for their foundations and for their corporations. So when, and, and the reason there is competition is because everyone is going for the almighty dollar because you got to pay your staff, you got to pay your bills uh, for your office, you have to pay for you know, equipment and whatnot to do uh, actions if you're if you're even doing that kind of thing but so it, it really becomes about performance and this you know it's like if you're competing in a capitalist marketplace then there's certain things that you have to do running your organization as a business and and one of them is you can't you can't be sidetracked you can't be dis distracted by what happens at this particular demonstration or distracted by that other issue or somebody gets in touch with you and they've got something that seems really you know amazingly important but no nope, can't get distracted by that either because we've got we've already set our agenda for the year we've set our goals and and basically each one of these victories will then be rolled over into notoriety or satisfying our funders so that we'll get more money and and you know the grassroots really doesn't perform that way we're able to, I, I think one of the advantages uh, to being grassroots is when something comes our way that's like really stunning, oh my God, this is a really something that somebody should do something about it. We do something about it, you know, <laughs> and, and, but the nationals can't do that. They absolutely cannot do that. And how many times have, have we called on national organizations, hey, we, you know, look what's going down. We just found out that such and such an entity is about to go out to, to, to bid for, you know, 40,000 board feet of tropical hardwoods. Sorry, can't help you, you know, and, and, and so we're on our own. And, and, and for us, organizing is about going to other grassroots organizations and seeing if we can pull them in. And sure enough, even if somebody's working on fracking or somebody else is working on, uh, you know, jobs versus uh, environment or something, they'll send a couple of people, you know, maybe we can rally a few folks out of that organization and that organization and, and, and whatnot, but forget it, trying to get anybody out of a national organization because, you know, they've got their agenda, they've got their staff time, punching a card, this is what I did today, and this is how my work today contributed to meeting that particular campaign goal so we can then send that email out to our supporters and say we had a victory or, or you know, send us more money and and then the foundation will say, oh, great, we'll fund you next year. You know, that's really what it's all about. And so on the other side, though, you know, money is resources in this horrible system that we've got going here. And, and, and so it is extremely difficult to get stuff done without, without these resources. And, and so that is the disadvantage, of course, of being grassroots. Um, but... Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I think a lot of us in the grassroots, we're, we're always walking that fine line. We'd love to get more resources, but there's, I can't tell you how many times Rainforest Relief has been offered uh, certain types of funding from corporations and how many times we've turned that down. You know, we've, there was one organization that said they would give us a certain amount of money per square foot of flooring sold uh, because they were saying it was environmentally friendly. And we were like, we looked at it and looked at it and finally said, you know, we can't take that money because that we, we feel like it would compromise our position. Um, and and uh, it, would, it could have amounted to plenty of, you know, a lot of money that, that we could have done a lot of things with. But I think that's one of the key uh, differences. 
And maybe the nationals think about this too. Okay, do I take money for, you know, we had an argument when Rainforest Alliance took some money from Home Depot in the midst of the Home Depot campaign, even Rainforest Action Network was like, well, wait a minute, Rainforest Alliance, what are you doing taking money from our campaign target? You know, the very organization that, that we're going after. Um, so there is that discussion that goes on sometimes, but I, I, I think in terms of where you draw the line with, from whom you'll take money, it's very clear to me that, that we're much stricter than a lot, uh, certainly the national. So that's, that's another aspect of it. All of you were talking about um, large groups have to grow and they have to do certain things in order to grow. But then as grassroots groups, we want to grow too. I mean, we want more people to be involved with our issue. So what are the differences between growth between the two? I've noticed that, yeah, of course we want to we want to grow because. But I I, I found that um, working with the specific groups that I tend to work with, we like to grow, um, and try to promote people empowerment. So so like we we tend to want to like go to communities and take the lead from the community members about you know um, you know things that they would like to see happen and we build relationships with them like if, for instance in East Harlem there was a gas pipeline that had just blown up and um, so my group Occupy the Pipeline we decided to go and, and meet with some of the people that had already like activated around it and we'd like to create a relationship with them um, and take their lead um, and that's the way to grow organic relationships and and um, I find that if I were working for a larger um, organization being able to hop on that issue of the Harlem gas explosion right away wouldn't be possible um, the structure system of this sort of top-down rather than bottom-up uh, yes there's benefits to both, but um, I find that when you have a top-down organization, you end up creating the same sorts of power structure that develop the same types of problems that are what we're trying to fight in this world. So I'm wondering if there's a way that maybe national organizations might be able to restructure this top-down sorts of power structure. Um, to rebuild a business in a better way. I mean, there's, there's, by mimicking exactly the type of corporation that we're trying to fight is already taking away power from people. Like for instance, if there's one decision maker at the top, you're probably missing out on a ton of like beautiful creative ideas that are just swirling around and you'll never know because you get very stuck in like this campaign, this campaign, this campaign. Um, there's something really powerful about a laser focus on a campaign, but there also should be more like opening to more organic ways of growing um, and building relationships with communities and with the people that you're working with. Things get done in small organizations. Uh, Pete Seeger said small organizations doing what needs to be done is what can change the world. It's the small organizations that really make a difference, and they all add up. Well, I, I, I kind of turn to biological systems when I think about growth, and um, there's a limit to effective growth. And I think that uh, by the time an organization gets big, it gets old. And it's time. It's, it, it's time for something new, something else to show up. So I, I don't know uh, how they, there is, a, there is an organization, national organization that I do like. There are a few actually, the Center for Biological Diversity. Their executive director, Kieran Suckling, he will not, he said, we will not take money from polluters. They won't take their money. And NRDC on the other hand, I, if I had time, I'd tell you about their collusion with Enron and their collusion with Weyerhaeuser and their, uh, anyway, um, Conoco. I think that 
it, it may just be in the nature of the the biology and actually the physics of systems and groups that at a certain point a, a, an organization outgrows its original mission unless it's very careful unless it's very carefully tended and the intention remains throughout all the changes of people and all the evolution of the organization it, ha it has to be very carefully carefully respected and honored or else um, it's the nature of things that an organization seeking money will get their hand will get its hands dirty and then it becomes irrelevant really to real change and that's when people have to start up again and keep starting up again like bubbles coming from the the surf from the bottom and coming up to the surface and then the bubble is finished and new bubbles come up I wanted to say as well that uh, you know for the for the nationals I think growth is basically adding staff and and how do you add staff you add staff with money I, I don't I don't think the grassroots in particular always thinks that way you know certainly we'd love to add staff very often we don't have any staff to begin with so <laughs> Adding staff would be like one, but you know, um, I, I think that uh, for us, growth is we're, what we're what we're looking for is greater reach, um, more volunteers, uh, you know, more awareness of the issue, and that doesn't necessarily translate into we got to hire another person or another two people. So again, it, it you know really I think boils down to money because. It, our, we can sometimes grow our issue without real money, like a lot of money, whereas the nationals almost always. And, you, you know, it, it, it sometimes I get quite frustrated and annoyed getting just all of these emails constantly from these national organizations. And, hey, I'll sign a petition along with, you know, I'm sure everyone else. But. You know, okay, so you sign a petition and then you get a weekly or bi-weekly or maybe sometimes even daily email from these organizations. And what does that mean from that organization's point of view? Well, it means that somebody's sending out that email. Somebody is writing it up, you know, so it's more staff people, more staff people. It always translates into we have more money so we can hire more staff. And that's what we call growth because for them, more awareness greater outreach and, and uh, more, you know, more people power is always based on more staff, always. So it always translates to a need for more money. So I, I think that's one of the, one of the big differences. You, you brought up NRDC and I, 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 I thought I would, you know, I actually, I, I have like a love hate. I, I won't even say, I won't even go to hate because I've ne I personally have not had any real negative um, issues uh, around NRDC, but I do have a story that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, back in the 90s, we were fighting along with, I think it was probably about six or seven of us in New York that were actually taking on uh, the whole issue of Clockwood Sound logging in British Columbia, and thus our campaign was the New York Times. We, we found out that the New York Times was getting uh, a, a small portion of the paper they were using uh, uh, fr in the West Coast edition uh, from this company, Macmillan Bodell in Canada, that was doing the, most of the logging. And uh, so we managed to, and it was incredible, uh, this, this woman, Lisa, who managed to get secure at the shareholders meeting in New York Times, a meeting with Arthur Sulzberger. Um, hello. <laughs> We've got a little female house sparrow here. Um, and uh, so at this, so we got this meeting, and sh and of course, at the time there was this Clockwood Rainforest Coalition, which was NRDC, Greenpeace, and Rainforest Action Network, a lot of you know big nationals, and um, so they wanted in on the meeting that we secured. So we 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 let um, you know someone from NRDC come to the meeting, and it happened to be a very well known son of political family who is on the board of NRDC uh, coming to the meeting, and 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 it was interesting that that um, he didn't come to the pre-meeting. Someone else from NRDC, a couple other people from NRDC came to the pre-meeting and all of us were like, 
New York Times canceled the contract. That's all we're going to accept at this meeting. This is what our goal. And we've been fighting for months and months along with Sierra Club New York and Perk and, 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 and a number of names of organizations that were basically iterations of all the four of us. We had four or five different organizations we were all part of. And uh, so we finally, we go in into this meeting and, and this person shows up. And of course, New York Times uh, is like, okay, well, we're going to keep the contract so that we can then tell this company what to do. You know, it's like um, some, uh, positive engagement, or, or I, I've forgotten the term that they use, but uh, constructive engagement. And, and we're like, no, no. And sure enough, this person's like, well, that sounds reasonable. I think, I think that makes sense. And we're like, no, 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 wait a minute, you know. And, and he just kept saying, no, I think that sounds good. And we were like, so we, we drowned him out finally. And, and sure enough, um, the meeting ended without any decision. But a month later, uh, New York Times, you know, canceled the contract with Macmillan Bodell. But just to say that, that, you know, the national group at that point was like, ready to go with constructive engagement and, and we know that doesn't work it didn't work in south africa we know you know in so many cases it didn't work in burma so um it, it, very interesting to see also I, I i find that the grassroots people are much less apt to compromise in those situations and i think that's a really really important aspect of the difference you know we when we sit down we're not i mean access is one thing to sit down and have this meeting but we're not there to make friends with this company. And I think a lot of times the national groups are because if they make friends, if Rand makes friends with Mitsubishi Motors, hey, then Mitsubishi Motors will put out a full page ad co-signed by Rand saying how great, you know, Rand is and all this. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. It's like, I'm sorry, but you're not my friend. You know, we want, we want you to stop doing what you're doing what, whatever that takes. And if, if locking down to Barnes & Noble's front doors means that Bar Barnes & Noble's never wants to talk to us again, well, that's what it means, you know. But as long as they stop using rainforest wood, we don't really care if they ever talk to us again. So I think that's one of the big differences as well. Yeah, I think I wanted to, to ask you guys to tell stories like Tim just told, and I'm going to add one of my own. Uh, there was a, there's an ecosystem near Albany where the mountains, instead of going north to south, go east to west, which is very unusual. And because it's an unusual geology, it's an unusual ecosystem. And so there are plants and animals that are unique to that area uh, of, of the world. And it's near Albany, so they've been developing it like crazy. 90% of that unique ecosystem had been destroyed. This is maybe 10, 15 years ago. And the uh, Nature Conservancy, which has a lot of good points to it, but in this case, uh, they said, okay, there's 10% of this ecosystem left. And we'll make a deal with the developers. You can have half of that. Well, the local conservation groups are like, no, they've already got 90%. We don't want them to have any more. And eventually, they were able to save 8% of that missing 10%. So the developers got 2%. Nature can say was going to give them 5 And they managed to save 8 So the local group proved to be more effective by basically moms standing at T PTA meetings, standing on street corners of the local highway as people are going shopping, telling people to protect our local ecosystem. Pictures of the Carner blue butterfly and, and certain kinds of blueberries and all these unique uh, critters. And, and so uh, it's another example of local overruling national with all their money. Um, but anyway, you guys us all have great stories. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've got lots of good ones. I'm trying to think what would be appropriate for me to talk about. Um, uh, you know, a couple of things. I mean, one, you know, there's a there's a large like campaign to 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 ban fracking in New York, and you know, uh, the large you know the larger groups have done a really great job of bringing bringing that like to making that more palatable for like the average person. So there is a strength in that. There is a strength in, um, you know, having the access to get through to the masses is, is powerful. Um, but I also find, so at rallies, when we work together with larger groups, um, the, 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 the people that are there protesting don't feel that it's 
theirs that does it doesn't belong to them that it that you know for instance they I, I changed a chant one time because you know just saying one thing over and over again it gets really dry and you want to keep people feeling you know juicy and you know excited and you can't say the same thing over and over again um, it just starts to feel dead and meaningless after a while so I changed up the chant and a few women looked at me and they were like you need to go and ask them permission to change that. Like, you can't just go and do that. Like, and, you know, I mean, my group, you know, we're a bunch of rabble rousers. We're like, no, 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 like it's, I'm trying to help keep the, the, the vibrancy the of this up because we're out here, you know, waiting for Governor Cuomo to come out and, we, you know, he's not going to be out for a while. So let's, let's keep ourselves going. And like, feeling good and the fact that I was totally turned down uh, like absolutely not we are not going to change this chant so I was like it that's what that creates is that that top down creates that where you the, the the community doesn't have a sense of ownership over banning fracking like it doesn't belong to one organization it belongs to you who wants your your water to be saved and wants your food to be preserved. I mean, you are, you are a member of the earth. You are here fighting for this for a reason. And it's just that that top down structure can make it really disempowering um, in that in that. I mean, that's a very good example of it, I find. So there's a compressor station uh, in Minnesink, New York, and the local organizations there are uh, have enlisted other grassroots organizations here in New York, and we're all working together to try and bring attention to stopping this travesty that's in the richest agricultural area in New in in New York that produces our organic foods they are uh, spewing out chemicals into the air. It's like the very worst place, if there ever was any good place. Um, and when we went to DC, uh, we went to DC to uh, fill up the courtroom as they were having hearings on the menacing compressor station, there wasn't any large organizations there. We filled the courtroom all with people all of us from different organizations that wanted to help uh, the farmers and uh, all the people in New York have fresh food. But did you see one large organization? No, there's no mobilization uh, available except for people doing good, people doing what is right to make a difference. So. I have a, have a direct response to that is that I, I, I find also that the um, a lot of times when we do work as on a very grassroots level on a campaign as very small communities together, um, and it does gain momentum. Um, I've experienced where um, you know larger groups will swoop in and you know pull their banner across and sort of take credit, take, take credit for the work that small communities have lost tons of sleep over and, and probably haven't nourished themselves to try to make this an issue. Um, so that's, that's one prime example of another thing that had happened. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, and that brings to mind uh, the, uh, the, this large organization that uh, goes in and refuses to change. They have banned fracking. Well, yeah, we want to ban fracking. But then they said, oh, maybe we should allow a moratorium. A moratorium allows them to continue to build the infrastructure, which did you ever see them build something they didn't use? So, you know, you, they, they, they're willing to compromise to get something to make points with their membership to make it sound good. We don't want them to make points. We want them to do what's right. Oh, personal stories. I mean, there's so many stories, but <laughs> how about the rainforest of New York, right? We didn't have any national organizations working on the largest entity that was importing tropical timber in North America. 
Nobody got involved with it except a, 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 a merry band of raggedy activists. <laughs> Small group of people. Ragged. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and one extremely well-dressed man. <laughs> Well-groomed, too. So we didn't get Rainforest Action Network, Rainforest Alliance, all the rainforest name people. We only had Rainforest Relief and New York Climate Action Group and an, another interesting group called Dog Walkers for the Rainforest. A couple of, of uh, you know, um, people working together, a few people working together to accomplish something that was so pivotal and so meaningful and to get the nationals to realize that if we did this one thing in New York City, we would affect a lot of rainforest wood, prevent it from being imported into the United States. New York City, boardwalks, park benches, deckings, uh, the bridge, uh, South Street Seaport, the, the ferry terminals, all, all this use added up in a, in a big city as the size of ours. And we went after, uh, Rainforest Relief went after the mayoral administrations year after year after year after year. And finally, with some other groups coming to work together, we did it. We did it. We did it by ourselves. And we did something that really mattered. You have to target when, you, when you're small, when you have only so much energy, when you're working for a living, to pay your rent and then you're spending the rest of your time at meetings or actions or climbing or you know when you're spending that kind of time you have to be very very selective you have to choose everything that you do with the maximum impact and where can you have more maximum impact acting locally than right here in New York City but the nationals didn't get it but we did uh, that I, I'm going to continue on the last story because I wanted to add one other factor, kind of the, some of the things you guys said that came up after the New York Times canceled the contract. We found out, ended up getting somehow, don't know exactly how, a letter that Rainforest Action Network had sent to one of their funders. And basically... They were saying in the letter that, um, in effect, they their network was responsible for winning the New York Times, and they the 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 words were East Coast Rags. Now Rags was the acronym for Rainforest Action Groups, and we were, you know, a couple of us in the East, uh, it, it, that were involved in the New York Times campaign were Rainforest Action Groups and were members of the Rainforest Action Network, but you know. And I was saying before uh, we actually came here uh, that kind of what happened in terms of Rainforest Action Groups and Rainforest Action Network and eventually Rainforest Action Network saying, well, we're not really a network. You know, we are just this organization in San Francisco. So you guys are kind of on your own. So we were on our own to do whatever that work, raise our own money, find our own staff, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, but when we actually had a huge victory... Uh, that had to do with the campaign they were involved in. Oh, it was their East Coast rags that won the New York Times. And, and they were sending this to a foundation to get more money. And uh, the, this kind of thing, we actually almost completely, completely broke ties with, with that organization at that point once we saw that because we had been for many years going back and forth as had a number of organizations with Rainforest Action Network about credit, where credit was due. And... You know, another moment uh, action comes to mind at a at this rainforest action gathering that we used to do annually with all the groups from all over the country that were involved in rainforest work. Um, I, I co-organized rainforest. We've co-organized an event in a, a gathering in out right outside Philadelphia. So what we would do is we would end up with 80 or 100 people at these gatherings, and so we always would do an action after because you've got a hundred rainforest activists suddenly in one spot and, and, and you know go after somebody and do something so those monday mornings were always like really very interesting whether it was texaco or uh sometimes uh i mean we mitsubishi they had all sorts of things but in this case 
we did Thompson Mahogany, which was like one of one of our pet projects to try to get Thompson Mahogany off of Rainforest Wood. Um, so we ended up organizing at, at this at this Rainforest Action Gathering how to you know do this protest Monday morning, and so. A couple of us, two of the very same people that were involved in the New York Times camp campaign later on, we went into the lumber yard and uh, with a banner and and uh, climbed up on top of a stack of rainforest wood and unfurled this banner, "Mahogany is murder," and someone with Rainforest Action Network took a photo of that, and uh, there it was two months later in their newsletter as the action that happened at the rainforest gathering and not even mentioning who was like the groups that were represented by the people that were up there or the fact that the whole really the action was I you know I scouted it we, we organized it and uh, um, and and the and the the whole uh, gathering was hosted by by uh, you know rainforest relief and Philadelphia rainforest action group so None of that was mentioned in the newsletter uh, that went out to, of course, all of Rainforest Action Network's members. It was just, here's, again, rags, uh, you know, hanging a banner at Thompson Mahogany. So it was that kind of thing for years we had been dealing with. And after a while, we kind of gave up and said, you know what? We're never going to get this, or this entity to actually give some credit away from themselves because, again, it all boils down to their own recognition their own convincing their funders that they're effective, that they're winning campaigns, et cetera, and to suggest that it might be someone else uh, can't do that. Um, You're going to lose that power. Okay. I, now, this has taken place during the left forum, and uh, I created this panel about comparing grassroots and national organizations. And, of course, everybody here is from a grassroots organization or several grassroots organizations. And the reason I did that is because national organizations have plenty of representation at the left forum uh, almost every panel there is with large organizations of, of different kinds so i was really pushing to let some grassroots people speak and have, have their voice and, and let and i maybe i'm letting the left forum say look we do grassroots too um but well we're outside the left forum so maybe <laughs> they can't even claim that but <laughs> yeah uh but my point is that where it's a bit of a paper type roots groups, do they have no other advantage other than money and staff? Well, they have reach. Um, they definitely have reach. Um, yeah, I mean, the the to to sort of take off on on what Tim was just saying, it's it's also if there were perhaps maybe like a raid on in our fracked gas campaign happening in New York that a lot of the smaller groups have worked on and maybe a larger group swooped in when we actually had some successes with you know some of the things that we we're working on um, if you make a stink about that they have control of the dialogue to say oh now look these people aren't working as a team towards fighting fracking you're now you're the ones that are trying to you know create problems and not working together so you know um, so they have the uh, the the reach of controlling the dialogue that goes out um, and um, that can work one of two ways it can be very positive it can be great that a lot of people are learning about what fracking is like who are all these people shouting about this word fracking I'm I'm seeing it over and over and over again I'm gonna look this up and and then they find out and it's it's good you know for education um, and it the you know that that's a that's a very positive thing uh, the structure that that is behind that, though, yes, does does tend to leave out, um, you know, the the people empowerment, which I think is a really big part of changing the world. Um, for instance, J.K. was working on um, addressing things like uh, fracking infrastructure, and and she also brought in rainforest wood to 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 address in Long Beach, New York. And, you know, typically, you know, I would, because I, I have a, a, just a passion and focus of focusing on gas infrastructure and fossil fuels, um, 
I was able to say, yes, like that is rainforest wood is part of the problem of the, the dark energy that's, you know, perpetuating the death of the planet or the life, that death of the life on the planet. And I would like to include that in what I'm going to be addressing that day. So I build large storybooks to talk about, you know, on a very elementary level, very complicated narratives to perform for people. So I was able to say, yeah, I want to talk about this liquefied natural gas port that's proposed off the coast, but I also want to talk about the rainforest wood that they want to use to rebuild the boardwalk because that's all part of the destruction of our planet. And I feel that if I had been working with a larger organization, they I wouldn't have had that freedom to just open up and you know, make a mention and make that a big issue and pull and link these things together. So. And to be clear, all voices to fight uh, the e economic and environmental and social injustices are needed. We just need to be aware of what the, the shortcomings are. Uh, I first learned about fracking five years ago from uh, a Sierra Club panel. And I met Al Alpleton and got uh, several people involved in New York City Friends of Clearwater's fight against it and brought attention to it. Uh, so they do good work, but they, we need to be aware uh, what, the diff what, the, what the shortcomings are, that's all. When you say the advantages of a, a large a national organization, advantages to whom? What, what do you mean by advantages? You mean advantages to the cause, right. to the greater right. cause? Okay. So I think that if a, group, if a large national, I, I don't mean to push a Center for Biological Diversity against uh, other good organizations, but their mission is to, is to uh, protect diversity. So if, you, if your mission is to protect diversity, so many other campaigns can plug into that, or you can support many other campaigns because there's always, there's always an issue of what life is at stake. You know, if, if we're talking about the Rockaway Pipeline, one big component of the struggle is that Jamaica Bay is endangered. The, the uh, right whale migration path is endangered. The, um, Ridley, Atlantic Ridley sea turtle, very, very delicately poised on the brink of extinction, is endangered. So Center for Biological Diversity focuses on, on that one aspect of things, not on impacts to humans, not on economical issues. So that's an advantage if they do what is needed or the... Um, What's the uh, Earth Justice? Earth Justice, uh, their job is to be the lawyers for the campaigns, for the different campaigns. If Earth Justice were responsive to the grassroots, we could have lawyers out there as a national organization that we could plug into. That would be an advantage. If, if, but I, I suspect. I don't know, really. My experience of Earth Justice is that they represent the large nationals in lawsuits. They used to be part of Sierra Club. Yes, they came out of Sierra Club. Um, an advantage of nationals. Well, I think that when we sign a petition to, uh, the petitions are often worded like this, to say, you care about polar bears, polar bears are dying, they're starving, they're, they're drowning, they're this, they're that. Sign this petition. And the petition doesn't really mention polar bears, it mentions, oh, you know, oil exploration in the Chukchi, Chukchi Sea. Okay, that's fair, you know, it does have to do with polar bears, I love polar bears, I'll sign the petition. And you're signing a petition to whom? You're signing a petition to, let's say, NRDC. Now, NRDC can sit in the back room of Congress, or they can sit in the boardroom and they can represent you because you signed their petition. So they can count you. So well, the advantage, if the large nationals would fulfill the mission, would be enormous. That's the only advantage I see. 
I was with Greenpeace for nine months, and while I was there, uh, I saw a lot of things that really bothered me. I had great concerns about the way money was spent. Um, at the same time, the fact that they had the amount of money that they had access to to do some of these things, and and, and you know, in Greenpeace, I I think even at the time there were very few other national organizations that were willing to do the kind of direct actions that, that, that Greenpeace does. I mean, you know, Rainforest Action Network, Greenpeace, there's very few others that I can think of that would, I would say are big nationals, right, that, that do this kind of hard-hitting direct actions. Greenpeace, uh, while I was there, <laughs> we ended up organizing a ship action in Miami and uh, just going after this one container ship that that had been shown by uh, Greenpeace people in Brazil was carrying illegal mahogany. And Greenpeace threw like 80 grand at that action. And, and, and when I was first there, I remember the, when, I, when I first went there uh, and, and, and went down to the office, our, this other person and I, our, our role at the time was to go around the, the East Coast and find out what was happening to mahogany once it reached the shores of the U.S. Where, you know, what was the, what was the chain of custody and w where might there be places, <coughs> excuse me, where we could, you know, get in, get in the way of that. So I'm figuring, you know, we're going to get in some ratty old van and sleep in the van and, and, uh, and tool around and, uh, you know, eat out of cans and whatnot because that's what we do, right? So I get there. <laughs> dumpster dive you know whatever for our food no so i get there and this other guy's like dude we're on the gravy train now so you know we're staying days in where you know we've got this minivan the two of us we got a minivan I, I, like i'm thinking to myself i'm looking at the bills for these things and you know days in 99 bucks you know okay we got free breakfast but it was like 99 dollars. i'm thinking that's that's three school kids or four school kids they're 25 bucks to become a member of Greenpeace one night boom you know and I'm thinking to myself well so anyway after it was all done though the reality is it, it kind of hits home in some ways that we needed to be able to do that in order to pull off this action there were certain things that we needed to be able to do now would I have done them differently probably but at the same time it was kind of nice to be able to actually get a good night's sleep and you know be ready to go into these lumber yards starting at, at 12 midnight and 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 doing that night work you know and be be able to at four in the morning go back to a hotel room and 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 uh and, and uh you know sleep till nine o'clock or something but but the other thing about it was <laughs> they threw all this money at this one action and we didn't even pull off the action. I mean, we were at, we a bunch of people. They flew in from literally all over the world to pilot these boats and Zodiacs and whatnot. And we never got the banner hung. And, uh, you know, it was really kind of a, a bit of a fiasco, I thought, because um, I, I kept looking back at the banner that we hung from the parachute jump, five volunteers, and we had a bunch of volunteers behind the scenes too helping us you know and painting the banner we had like 20 people up on this roof rooftop in new york painting the banner we spent two thousand dollars on that we got just about we got every daily newspaper in the city we got the china chinese daily and the russian daily uh you know but but the reality is that they you know greenpeace gets the media when they do a big action they hang a banner off some you know, smokestack like that about coal, the press covers it. And, and that's one of the advantages as well. I ha you have to admit that, that okay, so throwing 80, 80 grand at an action, when, it, like, it goes viral around the world, that actually is probably cheap in the long run. So there is, the, you know, it's undeniable that there are certain things that are advantages uh, to having access to those kinds of resources. Is there a danger of greenwashing with these large groups? Um, you know, you have large groups that are trying to promote nuclear power, right? The most poisonous way of making electricity we have, and yet there are groups that call themselves environmental trying to promote it. You have groups that are saying, well, natural gas is good. Fracking's bad, yeah. Uh, but, but somehow natural gas is good, as if they divorce the two 
uh, topics. So there's a lot of greenwashing involved, despite the effect, the good effect that a large group can have. So how do you, how do we balance that as activists? Because we want to target the people who are doing the polluting, but then there's this tendency that since we know about the large groups that are kind of supporting the polluters sometimes, but not all times. So how do you balance that as an activist? I don't know if I can take that question right now. I have to think about it. Yeah. I think one of the realities of that is that um, very often you don't balance it. And, 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 and how often has have these kinds of debates fractured so-called fractured the movement, you know, and, and, and certainly a lot of times, as someone, I think Donna, might have been you, said uh, that the nationals are, 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 are quick to capitalize on that and say, oh, or maybe, uh, maybe it was Kim, um, that, uh, oh, they're being, they're being contentious and, and, and uh, fracturing, uh, you know, the movement. But, but the reality is the reason the movement gets fractured is that the larger groups come in and compromise the position of the local groups. And, and you know, frankly, in a few instances, Rainforest Relief has not been the grassroots organization either. Even though we're all volunteer, uh, you know, we've fought campaigns in, in all, all around the region. And, geez, in Ocean City, I don't live in Ocean City. None of, none of the people with Rainforest Relief live in Ocean City. So really, the grassroots is not Rainforest Relief in that case. It's the people in Ocean City. And so we've had disagreements on, on uh, you know, campaign strategy and what what is uh, okay and what isn't okay. But one thing that we did uh, working with the local folks, Friends of the Rainforest in Ocean City is, is finally said, we're not going to create the, po the policy decision here. It's got to be up to the Friends of the Rainforest and we'll adhere to whatever decision they make. I can make recommendations and actually sometimes even in public say, look, that's not really our position, but we're not going to come in here and and outposition the local group. How many times have we seen that? I mean, it, going back to Clockwood Sound, it was actually the reason why we were fighting the New York Times and and uh, other groups were, were going after Pac West or for their phone books made out of rainforest paper out of out of British Columbia, etc. Was basically due to an organization in British Columbia called Friends of Clockwood Sound, and they were the they were the folks coming out of Tofino and, and, and these areas right around the logging, forming that organization, and eventually realizing that uh, a big component of that campaign had to be in the U.S. because there were these various companies using the paper that was being uh, produced from the logging there. So they started reaching out to U.S. groups, and, we, and Rainforest Relief and a couple of groups here back in 93 were some of the earlier groups to respond to that, but uh, very shortly thereafter, Rainforest Action Network, Greenpeace, and NRDC responded as well and formed the Clock at Rainforest Coalition. And eventually, sure enough, it was that set of groups, along with Sierra Club, I think um, Canada and uh, BC, that ended up negotiating the agreement with the logging companies. And guess what? Friends of Clockwood Sound didn't sign that agreement and the woman who was at the time the uh, director of friends of clockwood sound i asked what was you know what what do you think about this agreement and she said well we we couldn't sign it because it involved more logging in clockwood sound so we felt that there was no way we could sign on to an agreement that meant that even any more logging could could go on and uh so sure enough these big organizations came in you talk about greenwashing. I mean, that agreement, if you look at it, and, you know, Home Depot, perfect example as well. Define greenwashing? Well, here, here's a good example. Home Depot decides after two years of campaigning, and we were involved in that as well, but as a Rainforest Action Network that was kind of, you know, the lead national group on that campaign. They finally create a commitment that says we will end the sales of all wood from endangered forests. This was the end of 1999. We will end the sales of all wood from endangered forests by 2002. And so 2002 rolls around, and lo and behold, you go on their website, and that agreement, which we all had a copy of because we'd seen the press release from Home Depot, we'd still had copies of it, uh, 
oh, lo and behold, their wood policy uh, is actually slightly different than what they said in 1999. So, and then sure enough, it changed a few years later as well, again. And, and, and each time it changed, it allowed them to still sell a little bit of wood from endangered forests, and maybe a little bit more from endangered forests. And what it became about was, oh, we're gonna sell more certified wood, we're going to uh, uh, you know, avoid this egregious that, and, 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 but sure enough, you go into a Home Depot design place today, right here in New York, and you see flooring that's all, you know, tropical hardwoods that's definitely coming out of endangered forests. I can point out six or seven uh, items very quickly in a Home Depot that are all endangered rainforest wood, and, 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 uh, or wood from endangered forests, let me put it that way. And uh, so, but Home Depot is seen as, they, they tout their wood policy as so incredibly sustainable and progressive this, and uh, so, you know, and Rainforest Action Network has never said boo about Home Depot since the campaign victory. I mean, they had somebody on staff doing follow up for a little while, but, you know, then then no more. And so Home Depot kind of gets away with being a friend of the environment that are that their wood is is all great, but it's not really the case. So that's what I would call greenwashing. Uh, the politicians and uh, the c c c large organizations start talking about fighting fracking, but they're not against nuclear. And they're calling nuclear clean energy. That is the biggest greenwashing out there when they're calling uh, n nuclear uh, anything but the most horrific uh, danger to people ever. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of years of pollution, not just uh, a few, you know, which is our, li our lifetime. Uh, Fukushima is still a danger to us. You don't even hear it in the news anymore. Fukushima has been put under the, under the cover totally, and it is still a danger of hurting our world. And so I think nuclear is the biggest uh, uh, greenwash subject out there. Uh, you know, you, you guys, everybody listening to this, you are environmentalists. You need to know that if you love the air and the water and the, uh, and the ground and people and animals, you are an environmentalist. And we need you all to join the grassroots organizations or speak up and form your own grassroots organizations. Your voice needs to be he heard. It's only your voice that is going to make a difference. So uh, talking about greenwashing and talking about fracturing the movement, and they're related. You know, I, I was thinking about the Great Bear Rainforest and how Greenpeace took a lot of credit, and Kimberly Clark, was Kimberly Clark, right? Took a lot of credit for working out a deal to save the Great Bear Rainforest, but they saved half of it. They gave up another half of it. And they didn't negotiate with the indigenous people who are still, who are still talking about how they were betrayed. So that was a giant greenwashing. People can look at Kleenex and say, wow, they worked it out. They saved half of this, they don't know it was half. They saved this giant rainforest in Canada. So that's a glaring version of greenwashing. But what, when we attack, and that's the word, right? When we attack the nationals for greenwashing, instead of the corporations that are at fault, are we doing the right thing or the wrong thing? I think that, I think that as painful as it is to do this, to go against an organization that speaks as uh, um, saviors of the planet, to know that they're really betraying us, we have to do this. We can't negotiate 350 parts per million up to 400 or 450. We can't do that. We can't let things get softened and slid, slid under. We can't play with the physics. This is life at stake right now. Life is at stake, not just human life. Much of life is at stake right now. And we don't, we don't have the privilege of being polite to the national organizations. They, ha they have to be called. 
they have to. And and if if these numbers of people, these these numbers that they claim as as part of NRDC or part of Sierra Club, of course Sierra Club, they get money from their members. If these organizations are called to task and they have to step up, a lot of voices, a lot of voices will carry. So I think that as, as unpleasant as it is to speak against a, a groups that so many people put their faith and trust into is, is absolutely essential. Or we're not going to make it. We're just not going to make it. About greenwashing, um, well, a, a couple of things. Um, I mean, I think that the United States government having an environmental protection agency um, is is the biggest part of greenwashing. I mean, um, I mean, we they they work they work against the people. They compromise so much, and their name is the Environmental Protection Protection Agency. Um, there's no possible way of actually calling them out because our democracy isn't working. Um, but we have that in place, the, this EPA, and people will say, well, go complain to the Environmental Protection Agency, but it doesn't work for the people. Um, that's, a, that's a good example of greenwashing. Um, another personal example of greenwashing is in my former life, I used to work um, as a handbag designer in the fashion industry, and I would make handbags that were made of PVC and I, I one good thing I refused to work on the leather lines they they granted my vegetarian lifestyle permission to not work on the leather lines but you know I worked on you know a PVC line that was made of fossil fuels and this enormous corporation had a sustainability um, office and they nominated me as like their sustainability captain for my my handbag squad and because uh, I was seen as like the hippie that cared about the environment and you know and it's like these people didn't do anything except write letters um, to the public um, for their for their shareholder meetings on what they're doing to become sustainable and they didn't do any of it I've been to the factories in China um, they're not they're not doing any anything to be sustainable the very structure of their corporation is not sustainable going back to how you know I'm worried about large you know environmental organizations following that same structure of a large corporation that isn't sustainable so luckily I don't work in that handbag company anymore Um, well, um, SANE Energy Project, we're working on um, establishing an upstate-downstate relationship with um, farms and, and people. So we're, we're working with the, um, the Food Not Fracking campaign, and we're trying to encourage people to get to meet their farms and establish real relationships with farmers and with their food. Um, once people understand where their food comes from, um, I think that they will understand how um, fragile and important it is. Um, and we're also working on um, a citizen radon watch to, you know, that's another stab we're trying to take at the fracking industry to prevent people from, um, you know, uh, from having their, their natural gas that is currently coming into the city be monitored for radon levels because we know that there's high radon coming into the gas into New York City right now. Um, we're Occupy the Pipeline. We're ho having like no impact picnics to try to encourage people to like, what is it like to bring your own utensils and bowls and plates to a picnic? And how, can we live that lifestyle? And it teaches you how easy it is, and maybe people will guess again, you know, like, oh, next time maybe I don't want to take that plastic wear. Maybe I'll throw, you know, a fork and a knife set in my bag and just walk around in case I'm at a picnic or something with somebody. Um, and, you know, we're always making big, giant artwork to, you know, just go and um, tell stories to the public about, you know, 
different ways they can get involved and different ways that they can learn and be educated upon how to be a better person in the world. So. And that's my Occupy the Pipeline line. Thank you for... for <laughs> you know, I, I love being involved with Occupy the Pipeline because we are really a, uh, such a creative group of people that bring a lot of attention to every issue. And uh, Kim is such a delight to work with. So uh, thanks for your creativity, Kim. Um, and the uh, New York City Friends of Clearwater is an environmental education organization. We are we go into uh, uh, street fairs and and uh, events and table, uh, bringing attention, trying to educate people to the issues. Uh, our new venture of uh, I shouldn't say venture because we're all free. Uh, our new project uh, with uh, Pete and Toshi Seeger's Environmental Educators Network is going to really. Uh, hopefully have a really huge reach to uh, st both educators and people who want information uh, about the environment uh, all over the country. So it's, it's going to be huge and we invite people to be part of that. Uh, and you'll be hearing more about it. Uh, Reclaim.cc uh, is uh, going to bring a lot of attention to uh, uh, corporations usurping uh, large organizations and uh, we'll be hearing a lot more of that too. Well let's see. Uh, oh I'm part of Occupy the Pipeline too. <laughs> but They said it. Uh, Coalition Against the Rockaway Pipeline. Well the, the Rockaway Pipeline was approved a few months ago. So construction is due to begin Today's June 1st. Construction is due to begin in June. So what do we do now? Um, we know that if we did muster the money to get a lawsuit going, the construction would continue. So what, what we're deciding right now is whether to, where to put our energy. And Occupy Wall Street Environmental Solidarity Working Group is also on that line, on that same line, what, where to put the energy for communities that have already had the pipelines laid or that are communities that are fighting pipelines or pipeline infrastructure or other um, fossil fuel use or uh, nuclear. And that is to go around, not to go through, but to go around the fuel itself, to help people provide themselves ways with renewable energy that's a f that they can afford and that they can control. So Ken can talk about this too, but um, bringing solar thermal to the Rockaways in a way that people can, can uh, heat their homes in the winter and their hot water uh, on their own rooftops in, an, in a way that pays off in a few years. Um, bringing uh, um, local sources of other kinds of energy, um, negotiating the whole wind energy campaign and figuring out how to do it right. And, and another way that we're, we're considering going is to, is, is sort of like the Home Depot campaign. If you can take out one major player, the others fall in line. If we can unite with other communities that are facing Williams Company, just one company, we would have a network as powerful and as intricate and co as connected as Williams' own pipelines would be. So this is what we're thinking of. And also, I'm going to let you talk about the other things that Occupy Wall Street is doing. But also, New York Climate Action Group, we're forever tied to, we're married to Rainforest Relief. No, 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 we're not. <laughs> and so we're talking about, kind of, so, or we're sister and brother is what we are. We're, we're talking about, um, Ken really, I mean, Tim really inspired me last month when he wrote that it would only take a small group of us to make a profound change. And we're going to talk about that some more. Okay, so we're all in the question. Right, in, right now we're in the question. Uh. Rainforest relief, uh, it's, we've been around for 24 years and, and w one of the things 
I wanted, I neglected to mention earlier was that, uh, you know, how many national organizations do you know that have been laser focused on a single campaign uh, strategy for 24 years? I don't know. Maybe, maybe Greenpeace whaling is the only thing that would come to mind to me. But um, we're, you know, we're committed to continuing to work to stop U.S. tropical wood imports and um, uh, because we, we, we believe, as we have for a very long time, that that uh, pulling the, uh, the financial rug out from under the first the primary wave of loggers in the tropics, that, that uh, the, the loggers that bulldoze the, the new roads into pristine forests, is the single most effective uh, and efficient way at, at, at stemming deforestation, which I still believe is, is uh, one of the most efficient ways of, of slowing climate change. Um, so we're going to continue that fight. Uh, we're, we're, we're working closely monitoring New York City uh, on their use of tropical hardwoods. And I just wanted to correct, uh, you know, JK very, uh, in a very minor way. Um, New York City was the single largest end user of tropical hardwoods, not importer, but, uh, um, but uh, certainly there are other entities that we're going to be uh, targeting as well. And um, I just wanted to very briefly also add to the, the greenwashing thing. Uh, one of the things that, that I didn't get to say, uh, talk about, was really uh, this whole idea of certification. Uh, and, and, and I believe when it comes to certifying logging in old growth rainforests, that's purely greenwashing because science has shown that logging in old growth rainforests destroys old growth rainforests. So at whatever level of logging, even so-called low impact, i.e. certified logging you're you're actually destroying those forests and and uh well because tropical rainforests are incredibly fragile they're, they're the, these are ecosystems the biodiversity of which is is orders of magnitude greater than almost any other ecosystem on the planet so if you go in there with the bulldozer and 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 even taking out you know, a couple of targeted trees in an acre, you, the, the loggers, uh, one tree uh, that's targeted, they end up uh, destroying, uh, killing up to 30 other trees. And, and, and that is absolutely destroying the forest at that point. You're, you're wiping out species, and I don't care what anyone says, but if somebody is going to pretend that logging in a place where species are, are going extinct due to the logging is is acceptable or well managed and certainly the term sustainable is thrown out a lot i'm sorry i'm going to beg to differ so uh you know that's we we as an organization absolutely are opposed to any logging in in old growth rainforest and and one of the things that that comes to mind is this uh, a quote a shakespeare quote from julius caesar and i think it's um uh forgive me a oh, oh, bleeding piece of earth that I am meek and, and humble or meek and mild with these butchers or something to that effect. And, uh, you know, organizations coming in and compromising and, and supporting the Forest Stewardship Council when the Forest Stewardship Council allows for certifications in old growth rainforests and, 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 not, and not saying that this is wrong, uh, you know, just strikes me as um, that quote really comes to mind for me. So, uh, one of the things I, I wanted to say uh, in terms of rainforest relief, you know, we would love to have access to some of the money that these groups have. Um, we fought Avon last a couple of years ago on uh, a, a, a New Jersey. almost a mile long boardwalk they were putting in post Sandy, uh, having ha their 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 boardwalk prior to that also made out of rainforest wood, having been totally destroyed or very much largely destroyed by Sandy. And, and what prevented us from winning that campaign, we couldn't come up with the $2,500 to hire the legal team to, to, to fight this out in, in court. Because, and we thought we had grounds, uh, plenty of grounds for stopping them uh, with a court action, but uh, couldn't come up with that, that small amount of money. So, you know, folks, <laughs> if you want to really be effective with your $100 check, Rainforest Relief. <laughs> and... Uh yeah, uh, Occupy Wall Street Environmental Solidarity Working Group uh, still meets every Friday at 6 p.m. We have different locations that we meet. 
Uh, the public atrium is 60 Wall Street on the first and fourth Fridays of the month. And uh, the public atrium at 53rd and 3rd on the second, Wednesday, uh, second Friday, and then Judson Church on the third Friday. And um, we're dealing with energy efficiency issues. Uh, I had a meeting with some city council people and some architects uh, to get something going on that. And uh, we're always doing renewable energy stuff. We're always doing uh, stuff on fracking and nuclear power. Uh, July 16th will be the uh, 35th anniversary of the worst nuclear disaster in U.S. history, uh, Rio Puerco, New Mexico. And uh, we're working with some Native American activists on that issue this July. I'm also working with Somos Todos Japan, uh, connecting Fukushima Indian Point and Rio Puerco. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're keeping pretty busy with <laughs> an environmental solidarity. And, of course, I do an environmental radio show every other Tuesday in WBAI where I talk to grassroots activists like these wonderful folks as well as scientists and, and trying to combine the two so you have good information, but you're not sitting there going, now that I know that, what do I do? These folks can help you do it. So thank you, Donna. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, JK. Thank you, Tim. This was a great panel. You really missed something left for them. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you to our wonderful audience who came to see us. Thank you to the great, wonderful audience that came to see us out here today. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you, Environment TV. <laughs>